Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Pakistan panel session with Capra Falconeri Traveller in partnership with the Pakistan High Commission London and supported by Wild Frontiers. My name is Anam Hussain. I'm a diaspora and a travel journalist. My work has been published in various different publications, including Al Jazeera and Condé Nast Traveller. I'm also the founder and creative director here at Capra Falconeri Traveller, and I will be your host for tonight. For those of you who don't know, Capra Falconeri Traveller, we are an independent travel magazine based in the UK and dedicated to destination Pakistan. Now, as we all know, we are all here tonight to, to talk about all things Pakistan, whether it's the food, the culture, the adventure, the wildlife, or the northern areas. We will try and cover as much as we can about this destination tonight. Before I introduce you to our wonderful panel of experts, I just want to run through a few background details and tell you about the, how the next hour will unfold. Firstly, I will begin with my own story with Pakistan. And then I'm delighted to say that we will be joined by the High Commissioner for Pakistan to the UK, His Excellency, the Honorable Mr. Moazam Ahmed Khan, who will deliver a speech shortly. After that, the next 30 to 35 minutes, I'm going to put questions to the panel. Finally, towards the end, we will take some questions from you, which you have the opportunity to ask along the way. The best way to do that is to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and we will try to get through as many questions as we can. We also have the chat function right next to the Q&A button. Maybe you've been to Pakistan several times and you want to share your most memorable experiences with everyone else, or maybe you've never been to Pakistan and you want some tips and guidance um, from your fellow attendees um, to plan your visit. And one of our team members, Aisha Farooq, our editorial director, will be posting really useful links in the, ch in the chat, uh, which you can save and read later. Before wrapping up, we will play a short video by Wild Frontiers titled Pakistan in 60 Seconds. So I will just share my screen. So I'm Anna, and I was born in Pakistan in the city of Lahore and grew up in the United Kingdom. It is thanks to my parents that I'm still deeply connected with my homeland and roots, walking where my ancestors once walked, and each visit for me has been a journey of self-discovery. And Lahore, which once served as the capital of the Mughal Empire, is one particular city that has always inspired me a place that resets my creative energy and gives voice to my artistic expressions. Just watching traditional textile experts and skilled craftsmen creating these wonderful patterns in the clothing markets and ancient bazaars of Lahore led me to collect intricate Pakistan-made fabrics and start my own career in fashion design some years ago. And Lahore became the ideal place for me to fulfill my curiosity about self-design. One of my more personal connections with the country include redesigning our family home in Lahore. I have found great excitement in learning about Pakistan's vibrant interior decoration and modern architecture, blending age old traditional Pakistani handicrafts with contemporary design. In the process of which I had the opportunity to be in conversation with some of the famous architects of Pakistan. Beyond that, my adventures in Pakistan include staying in the very remote villages of Kiran and Sharda in Neelam Valley, Kashmir. These are particular corners of the country that have captured my imagination. The views were just breathtaking from the outset. I've taken a 24 hour train journey from Lahore to Koita, which is in Balochistan. That was quite an adventure. Another unique experience has been dining at a small cafe in Kavai, which is at the base of a waterfall where the tables are actually placed inside the shallow running water. So while you're enjoying your food, you can dip your feet into the cold stream. Now, all of these experiences gave rise to launching a travel magazine, Capra Falconeri Traveler Pakistan, which is a scientific name of the national animal of Pakistan, the Maho, a wild goat found in the mountain regions of Pakistan. We issue one of the magazine focusing on the modern adventures around Pakistan, including scuba diving, um, glamping, yoga in the mountains, amazing hotels, 
wildlife conservation, sustainability. Um, so if you haven't already, I will highly encourage you to grab a copy. So Pakistan has the most special corner in my heart and a place that's there for a lifetime of exploration. Now that's enough of me. So now I would like to invite His Excellency, the respected High Commissioner of Pakistan to the UK, Mr. Mazam Ahmed Khan, to give an insight into the travel world of Pakistan. I think we have two things in common. I'm also Lahoreite, and I also have Pakistan very close to my heart. Let me at the outset commend Kepra Falconery Travellers for partnering with the High Commission to host this webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you would all agree that in terms of travel and to tourism, Pakistan is perhaps the world's best kept secret. It is a constant display of diverse vistas, cultures, faunas and flora. From shining desert to lush forest, from fertile plains to verdant valleys, Pakistan has a great deal to offer. Not many people know that so rich is the diversity of Pakistan's landscape and cultures that the vistas, the cuisine, the folklore, and the dialects change every 50 kilometers. Not many people know that Pakistan is home to the largest chunk of glacial ice outside the North and South Poles. Amongst its riches is the earliest and most enigmatic civilization known to man. Amongst its heritage, one of the first known universities and among its legacies, some of the most iconic religions of the world, including Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, and of course, Islam. As a land, ladies and gentlemen, that connects Asia's diverse regions with one another and with the global sea lanes, Pakistan represent a, represents a wide amalgam of Central Asian, South Asian, West Asian, Chinese and even European influences. Pakistan's great value proposition is its diversity, its cost effectiveness, its uniqueness. There is nothing like, like it anywhere else and finally the fact that it offers a complete package. From adventures to medical tourism and from spiritual journeys to sports, culture and literacy, literary activities, Pakistan has something for everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, it was for these reasons that Lonely Planet has called Pakistan tourism as next big thing. Forbes ranked it as one of the 10 coolest places and the British Backpacker Society declared Pakistan as the world's third, third best potential adventure to destination for 2020. The year before, the British Backpacker Society declared that Pakistan tops the list of world's best travel destinations, describing it as one of the friendliest countries on earth. The World Economic Forum has placed Pakistan amongst the top 25% of global destinations for its UNESCO World Heritage Site. Ladies and gentlemen, the government of Pakistan has made travel and tourism a high priority. Before the outbreak of the pandemic, Pakistan introduced a new streamlined online visa. You can now get your visas in your inbox by simply uploading a few basic documents. The visa on arrival facility is available to the citizen of 65 countries, including the UK. 
the past few years have seen a marked improvement in Pakistan's security situation, and this is amply reflected in improved travel advisories. During the pandemic, Pakistan coped with the situation better than many countries, both in terms of health and economy. Pakistan is amongst the few countries that successfully managed to save both lives and livelihood. We are the only country to constantly rank among the top three on the Economist Global Normalcy Index that tracks and ranks recovery for the pandemic. In short, Pakistan is open for business, as is Pakistan's tourism sector. From the UK alone, again something which not many people know, every year around 500,000 people travel to Pakistan. Will you be the next to discover the world's best kept secret? That is the question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, High Commissioner, for that very valuable opening, your excellent leadership. It is honestly a great honor to have you here with us today, and it was a very good starting point. I hope you will stay till the end. Thank you. Right, now let's move on to our lovely panelists. First up, we have Colin Pryor. Colin is an acclaimed landscape photographer with almost four decades of experience. He seeks out patterns in the landscape and the hidden links between reality and the imagination. His images capturing sublime moments of light and land are the result of detailed planning and often take years to achieve. Among Colin's awards are the National Adventure Awards, Business Category winner in the year 2015, and the Scottish Award for Excellence in Mountain Culture in the year of 2020. He has been the subject of three BBC documentaries entitled Mountain Man, and he has just completed a six year project in Pakistan's Karakoram Mountains. Also just launched his photography book titled Ice Mountains of Pakistan. Next up, we have Johnny. Johnny is the author of three travel books, Running with the Moon, for a Pagan Song and Silk Dreams Troubled Road. He is also the founder of Wild Frontiers, an award-winning travel company. His interactions and lifelong friendships with the people of the Kalash led him to create the first of his itineraries to Pakistan in 1998, titled The Hindu Kush Adventure. Next up, we have Emma Thompson. Emma is a multi-award-winning travel journalist and a regular contributor to the National Geographic Traveler. The Telegraph and The Times. She often covers countries recovering from natural disaster or political upheaval to help travelers regain trust in these spaces. She's also an experienced speaker and a regular travel writing panelist. She has featured on BBC Radio 4 from her own correspondent and presented for TV. Her book, The Silent Traveler, is due to be published in spring 2022. And last, but certainly not the least, we have Ghulam Rasool. Ghulam is a wildlife and nature photographer. He first encountered wildlife while accompanying his cousins, who were avid bird hunters in Pakistan. Flying kites, running after birds, watching clouds at sunrise and sunsets, and stargazing at night have been his early fascinations. At the age of 13, he found his father's rangefinder camera and a sunrise reflection on a roadside puddle was the first picture he captured. Experimenting with various forms of photography allowed him to work with WWF Pakistan as a nature photographer. He has also launched a coffee table photography book titled Colors of Deo Sai, showcasing beautiful migratory birds, stunning landscapes and lakes. Finally, we have Aisha Faru, our editorial director, who has experience in copy editing and digital journalism. She is continually fascinated by the homeland of her parents and her grandparents. She will be moderating the event tonight and uh, will be there to answer any of your questions in the chat. And that is our panel. Welcome everyone. It's so good to see you all here. I'm going to dive straight into the first question. How would you respond to the most common stereotypes or misconceptions about Pakistan? 
What are your personal interpretations and observations of the country? Emma, let's start with you. From the perspective of a travel journalist, what, were you, what would be your response and what has been your understanding? It's interesting because I actually just encountered this today. I was uh, telling my guide that I was on the panel tonight. Uh, he's a local Sri Lankan. And uh, he said, oh, Pakistan, you know, I wouldn't want to go there. And I said, well, why not? And his sole opinion of the place had been informed by news headlines. And sadly, I think that's the case uh, for, for many people. And I think um, they're, they're sort of based in two camps, the people that have been to Pakistan and know its charms, and the people have yet to travel to see the reality. I remember when we were visiting, when I visited, um, a very wise man said, you know, all that you read is not the whole truth. And it's, and it's certainly true when it comes to Pakistan. Absolutely. Thank you, Emma. Colin, what would you like to add to that? You're on mute. I think one of the big challenges for Pakistan is to, to try and um, get more information out there about the fact that K2 exists in Pakistan. Um, I think when you talk about um, the Karakoram Mountains to people in general, they, 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 most, most people haven't heard of them. And, and I mentioned K2. And it's not uncommon for people to say, uh, in Pakistan, K2. And I say to them, yep, the last time I was there, I'm sure K2 was as well. But I think there's this misconception that, that K2 is in the Himalayas and probably in Nepal, people imagine. But um, I, I would also um, just um, agree with what Emma was saying about um, uh, people um, believing that Pakistan uh, is a dangerous uh, destination to travel to. I mean, I've been going there since 1996 and I've never had a bad experience. And the, the people that I've met there have been extremely um, friendly and helpful, and in fact, you know, in many instances, you know, my life was entrusted to them uh, in some of the crevassed areas and the glaciers. Um, so I think uh, the media um, is is responsible largely for um, that perception, and, and and perhaps Pakistan needs to to try harder with good news stories rather than bad news stories all the time, which is what the media constantly put out. Yep, absolutely. Thank you very much, Colleen. You're absolutely right. What about you, Johnny? What would what would you say to someone who carries a certain image of Pakistan? How can they break through those barriers, uncover the myths and debunk any misconceptions about Pakistan? Well, I set up a travel company pretty much solely for this purpose. Um, and I've been banging the drum for Pakistan for the last 25 years. Like Colin, I went for the first time in 1996. To be honest, I, I was really more concentrated on India and Afghanistan, and Pakistan just happened to be in the middle uh, when I was traveling through. But when I got there, I was blown away by it. I thought it was one of the most beautiful, hospitable. Um, His Excellency, the High Commissioner, summed it up very eloquently when he said, you know, talked about all the different aspects of Pakistan, the, the rich culture, the history, uh, the landscapes, the people. Um, and I just tell people that, and I've set up a company and made videos and written blogs and written articles and goodness knows what to try and persuade people to go there. And I'm pleased to say that finally, you know, in the last three or four years, COVID notwithstanding, um, it, it's starting to get through. And I think that negative image is starting to be shed to some extent. What was great was, um, I don't know if you remember, a few years ago in London, Pakistan, government suddenly did start to promote some really good positive messages. There were, I don't know if you remember, London buses with all these fabulous images of Pakistan on it. And I was like, wow, that is fantastic. A really good image of Pakistan with polo players and the Kalash and all sorts of wonderful imagery. And, and this is what people don't really understand about Pakistan back here in the UK. Colin's absolutely right. 99% of people will think K2 is in Nepal. That's one aspect of it. And of course, it's a, a, it could be a massive draw. 
But there's so much more to Pakistan, whether you're talking about going from the south, from Sindh, up through the Punjab, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I think the Pakistan government does have a responsibility to try to get more positive images out there into countries like Britain and America and places where, 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 where Western tourists will come from. But I think that has started and that's backed people like myself up and therefore Wild Frontiers are seeing a big rise in uh, tourists going to Pakistan. Great, I love that, so beautifully said. Hulan Masool, let's go to you. You were born in Pakistan as well. So you have a different relationship with the country than others do. So has the world got it all wrong about Pakistan? No, 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 no. I have a very different experience because, uh, you know, I grew up in a, in a society where I was like going through everything, a uh, very middle class family. And uh, <clears throat> I've seen areas and the places which, which are oblivious from the normal people. I mean, the general public. In my perspective, I think our own public is not aware of the uh, beauty that holds that Pakistan holds. For example, uh, most of the people they only talk about Kagan around. They don't know Pakistan away from that. And then they know, and the Punjabi people they know about Mari, but they don't know anything exists away from um, an Abbottabad or something like that. And wherever we find something, we start going over there without any purpose and without anything in mind, and that kills the beauty of that area. So in my perspective, I think the mainly the responsibility is uh, on the shoulders of the people who are related with the media, uh, mostly uh, media uh, professionals because they are not educated enough and they don't have the right kind of, uh, I mean, supporting material to push through. And they are too much uh, political I mean, nature in promoting Pakistan. They are not into, uh, because you know, if you talk about the environment, if you talk about the uh, beauty, natural beauty, you need to study something, you need to have some kind of background, you need to have some kind of in-depth knowledge. I mean, there are technical terms and they are not, they have so many fish to fry, they have so many things others to worry about. And that's why I think this is the main uh, bottleneck at the moment. If we get through this bottleneck and you find more people like I said you and I um, mean, uh, Johnny Bellby, I'm very much fan of this man. I've known him since so many years now, but Colin as well, I met him uh, last time. And uh, I, I really, I really appreciate everybody who talks positive about that. But last but not the least, I would say like Pakistan is, when I came to know about this fact, you know, one of my uh, mentor, Richard Gostang, who a couple of years before he died, he came to Pakistan, he served, I think, 30, 30, more than 30 years in Kruger National Park. When he came to Pakistan to visit Pakistan on the request of WWF, he never left Pakistan. He married then and he lived there. But in the last few years, he went back to South Africa and finally died here. But he taught so much and so many people, he actually instilled the real conservation efforts in Pakistan. He's one of those people who actually started doing this thing, you know, very different, with a very different perspective, he gave chances. So <clears throat> we have an ocean to explore, uh, which is like, uh, we have no idea at the moment, like the kind of species we have, we are still, the number of species is still increasing day by day. We have more than 700 bird species, two and more than 200 mammals and same with the everything. And every day we find a new species, or oh, we find a new species over there. So it's mostly us, not the world, responsible for our, I mean, uh, reputation in the world. So if we are educated enough, if we find our, some, some goodness in ourselves, we should be proud and we should, I mean, let it go, let it show. Uh, of course, government should, I mean, come forth in the forefront, but mainly the people, media, they need to get together, they need to be educated. Great. Thank you. Ishma. Amazing. Thank you very much. Great answers from all of you. Moving on to the next question. So before we dive into the itineraries and the must see places, if someone has already been to Pakistan and are here tonight to find out about the lesser known places, what are some of the hidden corners of Pakistan that made you feel like only you have discovered? So Johnny, where is your little secret place? Uh, well, <laughs> 
I, I mean, I, I was very fortunate to be given a piece of land by the Kalash in a sub valley off one of the main Kalash valleys where, um, goodness, 20 odd years ago, I built a little log cabin for our groups that were going through there because they were trekking from one of the Kalash valleys over into Chitral and we used to stay at this friend's, um, one, one of the Kalash uh, gentlemen's little hut but when I was taking you know 12 people it was a bit too small so he gave me some land to build a, a new place and he looks after it and I, I think he probably uses it most of the time when I'm not there which is most of the time of course but it's absolutely idyllic it's up a side valley it's kind of right on the Afghan border it, it couldn't be more idyllic more beautiful um, so that's my little piece of heaven in in Pakistan. Fantastic thank you. How about you Bilal? From a photographer's point of view, where is that one favourite hidden place that, you know, you always find makes a good photograph there? Or even what makes Pakistan a brilliant destination for photography? You're on mute. Sorry. Right. Well, as a wildlife photographer and as a nature photographer, the most beautiful places that I've seen um, they lie in the north and in the north. One of the most important is the Brogel Valley, uh, which is a uh, in the Wuhan corridor, with bordering with Afghanistan and China on the other side. Uh, Kurumba Lake, which is almost on 15, between 14,000 and 15,000 feet, is one of the most beautiful lakes. I think it is 32nd highest biologically active. Lake. From biologically active means it supports life. It's not dead lake, it supports life. So I've been there two times. And luckily, oh, the second time when I went over there, it was 24th of July, it was my birthday. And I was looking at the full moon rising behind the chunk of clouds. And I was sitting at the almost 15,400 something like feet on the mountain. But that was the experience that actually made me <laughs> connected with that special area. So, that is out of the world area. I mean, if you go there, it's like an open vista in front of you. You will barely see anything. But if you, I mean, dig down a bit, if you start living there, for example, after a few hours, you start looking at things differently. Your world changes. Anyhow, uh, whenever you travel in Pakistan, away from cities where your cellular signals go off, only then, and when your music is off, especially, <laughs> you're not playing <laughs> this kind of, the kind of music. Only then you will be able to see, I mean, see what is around and listen, uh, which kind of birds are around and which kind of wildlife is around. But uh, the Kurumba, for no, sure, for no doubt, is one of the favorite. Great. That sounds incredible. Thank you for sharing that. So everyone at home will be posting the link to Balam's work in the chat so you can check out some of his incredible photography. Colin, what would you want to add to that from the perspective of a landscape photographer? What are some of the undiscovered places not many of us have heard of? And how do you go about creating that perfect image of those particular corners? You're on mute again, Colin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Who invented this? Um, it's not difficult to take great photographs in the, in the Karakoro Mountains. I mean, they are the most inspirational mountains in the world. Um, they've got a character that you, you, you don't find anywhere else. Um, the, 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 it's the spires and the towers and these cathedrals and minarets that um, they are so vertical that they shed snow. So unlike the Himalayas, where you've got these huge mountains, um, impressive though they are, covered in snow, it's not particularly exciting for photography. But the Karakoram are different, and you can see the picture of the Trango Towers behind uh, my head there. Um, that's a good example. Uh, the, snow, the snow has, has fallen off, um, and it just sticks on the, on the ledges and the towers up there. But I think a, a special place for me would probably be um, the Biafo Glacier. I mean, that, that, the, the Trango Towers that we're looking at behind me is on the Bolturo, and these are absolutely stunning um, in their own right. But the Biafo 
has got far less footfall on it. Um, and the mountains there are, well, even within the Karakoram, they're unique. And <clears throat> out with the, the glacier themselves, you, you, you normally are forced to, to, to camp on the lateral moraines. And if you're there um, in the early spring, the wildflowers um, on these moraines is absolutely amazing. The, the richness of species and colours, and some of them are very, very rare plants. I mean, I'm no expert on, on, on the plants, but it's, it's an oasis of life, even at, at um, 4,000 metres, or just below that. It's, it's quite remarkable. And if you progress further um, up the Biafo Glacier, you come to uh, the Simgang Glacier, which is, is a, a, and Snow Lake beyond that, which is, a, is a, an expansive area of flat um, uh, ice, and it's surrounded by the most magnificent mountains. And what I've cherished most of all um, on some of those early um, uh, journeys, when I say early, I was there last uh, in 2019, but um, I, I managed to go up and down these glaciers, we're, we're obviously with a group of porters, but we never met another single person. So when we left the Scully, a little group was obviously self-contained and we'd go up there and spend almost three weeks and return back down into a Scully. And you're not, you're not meeting another single person out anywhere in the world. Um, never mind anywhere with the visual assets that the Biafo Glaciers go. And you're there yourself in, in you know, 2019. Un, unheard of anywhere else in the world. Quite remarkable experience. What a privilege it's been to be there and do that during that period. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We will be posting a link to Colin's work in the chat box so uh, you can check out some of his really stunning and detailed photography. What about you, Emma? If you had to pick one or two places that made you feel only you have visited them? Well, today I've only explored the north and the place that really took my breath away uh, was the Hunza Valley. I mean, it's known as a sort of Switzerland of Pakistan. And as Colin said, it's sort of this cauldron of eight mountains around it. And um, it was cut off until 1978 until they finished the Karakoram Highway. So this is an incredible preserved culture and things that you wouldn't expect of Pakistan, uh, first of all, like this sort of, you know, belief in fairies still living in the mountains and, and lovely legends that accompany them. And, um, you know, they've got 33 varieties of apricots, one for each tooth, they say. <laughs> <laughs> um, just that sort of like pr preserved culture. And also there, it was um, slightly more relaxed at the time in terms of wearing headscarves and things within that valley as well. Um, that that I, I really enjoyed my time there. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, we've dropped in some of um, Emma's articles about Pakistan in the, in the chat box, so do read them later on. Very interesting and very informative. Right, I'm gonna move on to question three. So Pakistan is known for its diverse cuisine and delicious street food. I want to know what is your favorite Pakistani food? Why and where did you first eat it? Colleen, I'm gonna start with you. What was your culinary experience like? <laughs> um. When you're, uh, when you're on trek, it's not exactly, um, you know, high cuisine. And um, I mean, what, what, the, what the cooks are actually able to produce in the remotest parts of the world always surprises me. I mean, they can, they can you know, they can make pizza and pasta, which um, is, 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 you know, for a Westerner, it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasant change to, you know, the vegetables and the dal that, that we usually eat. But... I remember once in the Biafo Glacier, um, we stopped and, and the, the, the cook, uh, he did the most amazing pasta with a cream sauce. And you, you took two steps outside the tent and there was a massive crevasse. And it, it, was, the, it, was, the, it was this contrast between, you know, this excellent food and something that was potentially life-threatening, um, well, very life-threatening. And um, it was that contrast. Um, so rurally, um, you, you know, the, the food isn't hugely sophisticated. I mean, I'm usually staying in the K2 motel 
Um, and the food is simple and um, wholesome. And, and um, so my experiences are, are, are probably on this question very narrow and probably not um, what most other people enjoy in, in, in other more sophisticated parts of Pakistan. Absolutely, great. Okay, so let's go to you, Ghulam. How should we develop our taste and knowledge of Pakistani cuisine? You're on mute, Ghulam. Sorry, sorry. Talking about the cuisine, so being in Lahore, I lived like 20 years there. So uh, starting from Lahore to the north, uh, you can start from uh, anything, but the most importantly, if you go to the local, I mean, uh, the street foods, for example, our samosas and other kind of uh, I mean, uh, little snacks that you find on the roadside, they have mastered them in such a perfection, sometimes the people. Uh, I mean, we don't find that kind of taste even if we cook it at home. I mean, with whatever we do, we don't find that kind of taste. I don't know what they do. I mean, <laughs> there is something special. Maybe it's related to some kind of uh, emotional state that you are in at the time when you're in travel. Maybe a different kind of chemical balance in your mind, something happens with you. So whatever you taste is very, I mean, it takes you away. Even a cup of tea while sitting on the bench against, I mean, just on the roadside and all the buses going in front of you are just enjoying the daba. And uh, that, that, I mean, <clears throat> that is, uh, I mean, for me, uh, eating along the road when you're on travel, all, all the track routes and other kind of the I mean, areas, those are the, the best places to eat because those are the places where normally uh, the most professional drivers, they stop by and they eat their food and their food is up to the mark and <laughs> they don't stop anywhere else. So oh. those are the places to find. Brilliant, thank you so much. Emma, how was it, uh, how was it for you traveling with your taste buds across Pakistan? or something that you remember that you would want to, you know, try again? Well, Gulan's absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's all about the street food for me. I mean, things like Golgapa, which people, you know, in India will know as Panas Puri, where you have the sort yeah. of the fried semolina shells that you pop in the middle and you fill with the potato <laughs> and the chickpeas and the spicy tamarind sauce. No, delicious. Um, and then I also have a really sweet tooth. So I love things like uh, kheer, you know, the rice pudding with the cardamom. Fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant, absolutely mouth-watering. Johnny, what treats your taste buds? Um, like Emma, I, I love kheer, I love gulab jamun. That's another thing that I'm a bit of a sucker for. Um, and, and then the traditional stuff like your Rogan Joshes and, and things like that. Um, what Gulam said is absolutely right. I love stopping at the Chai Khanas on the Karakoram Highway and just going in where the truck drivers are and having you know your chana masala, your sabzi, whatever it is, delicious. Two things uh, that I have kind of interested me, uh, or three things actually. One was uh, apricot soup, going back to Emma's um, in Hunza, which has kind of got noodles in it and therefore quite a, um, a reference to China coming over from there. Um, Chitral has some really interesting cuisine in its own right, uh, particularly, and I don't know the name of it, I'm afraid, but they serve this delicious, it's almost like a quiche. It's kind of a, 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 a spinach cheese dish. Um, and then the kalash, make the kalash food in the kalash is pretty simple. Let's be honest. Um, but the women make this incredible bread called jowl, which is, if you imagine a bread discus, it's pretty hard. If you banged somebody on the head with it, it would hurt. But it's full of goat's cheese and uh, and walnuts, um, and they just cook it in the fire ash, and they pat the ash off it, and they give it to you, and you stick it in your pocket, and that will last you all day on a hike. Really, really delicious. Great, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, there's another question that I just want you to squeeze in. I'm going to put this to you, Ghulam, first. What is the best way to get around in Pakistan in terms of transport? Uh, should somebody, um, if they were to go for the first time, can they um, hire a car, get a guide? Or is it just best to book the Wild Frontiers? <laughs> Mm, uh, well, talking to somebody professional, you name uh, Wild Frontiers, it's, it's very important to talk to somebody before you go there. Uh, I mean, there are two different categories in my perspective. One is the people who, uh, who have roots in Pakistan, they go to meet their families um, <clears throat> most of the times. 
and uh, what they think that going to the families is basically tourism. So it's family tourism, it's not a tourism. Mm. So for, for our perspective, I mean, if you go for a real taste of that kind of Pakistan uh, taste, you need to talk to somebody and you need to go through that, do, I mean, get the angle first, and then you can find the places and the right places. Otherwise you will be roaming in circles and you don't find anything. I mean, most of the people who have bad experiences, they don't plan their trips. If you plan your trip, you definitely end up with big smiles, good heart, and have lots and lots of memories to cherish the rest of your life. Uh, this is what I feel like. Talk to somebody, get a professional I mean, advice, at least talk to somebody. If you are not I mean, going to pay, you're not going to join a group of somebody, talk to somebody. We are open and I mean, of course, I, mean, I know Johnny I mean, many of the people like you and our, 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 many people are there. So you can Google, you can talk to somebody, you will get enough information about Pakistan, how to move in the country. So going on your own, will definitely end up in kind, some kind of, uh, I mean, difficulties. For example, it's not, it's not that much elaborated as uh, elaborated in other countries, in developed countries. I mean, you go on the airport, you will find everything over there and it's very well sorted. One, two, three, go there, 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 and there. So I think that situation has yet to come, but at the moment we are lacking in that, uh, in that sense. So somebody definitely approach somebody professional and Great. Then plan it. Okay. Great. Before I move on to the next question, would anybody want to add to that? I, I would just add one thing, which is the old Willis Jeeps. When I do the little thing at the end you've asked me to do, I'll show a photograph of them. But the old Willis Jeeps that were flat packed into Pakistan in the in the 70s are just the most wonderful um iconic kind of transport you take the roofs off when you're traveling up in the north you could got this 180 degree view of the mountains they're wonderful you get a nice driver take you around you don't have to worry about it they know the roads they know how to drive and you get the best visual uh, impact great great thank you very much so i want to know in your opinion how can we contribute to sustainable and ecotourism in pakistan how can we ensure that when someone travels to Pakistan does so in a meaningful way for the local community and environment? Um, Ghulam, again, you're an advocate for ecotourism. What is your opinion? Well, <clears throat> I'm basically pro-nature and a pro-conservation person. I have served with the organization like WWF for like a decade or more, you can say officially, uh, on the routine and non-routine basis, mostly. Uh, what I have learned that the lack of education, which I mentioned earlier as well, uh, is the main problem in our uh, I mean, society. You can say we are unable to project the right thing. Uh, we need more and more photo tours kind of uh, tourism not just the tourism, taking the people, they go there, you stop by, take pictures and come back. Now, if you, I mean, for example, Colin goes with me, I, fall, I go with Colin, or Colin takes a tour to Pakistan. He goes to places, I have to go to some places. We will take some pictures and if those pictures come back, they will end up in some kind of articles, in some kind of publication, in some kind of, uh, I mean, news media rather than ending up in mobile phones and ending up on the social media doing nothing at all. So these kind of factors we need. And uh, uh, what else? You're, okay, ecotourism based. If you don't know what is the nature, you can't save it. So this is the main thing which is happening at the moment. Uh, uh, the, the, I mean, <clears throat> even the, our wildlife departments, I mean, the conservation departments, they are unaware. They are unaware where we, I mean, where to go so it's, it took me like more than 12 years to learn about a little bit about the land. Um, for example, on one side we have K2, which is one of the second, one of the highest, I mean, the second highest in the world. And on the other side, we have Makran coast. So this kind of, uh, I mean, this altitudinal variation is unparalleled in the world. It's like a country which is standing right this way. There's no other country which is, on one side is K2 and the other side of the Macron coast. So this much variation means this variation translates into the different zones and geographical zones. 
and those geographical zones turn up in diversity and that diversity i mean show up in different kinds of people different races and then the species and those species it's everything everything interconnected mm -hmm. so learning about it is most important so that's why my point again comes to the point photo tours more journalists like you like emma like uh, the people who are already promoting i mean the natural side of pakistan eco tourism the way out eco tourism is the way out there is no other way if you go there for example johnny johnny must be knowing that eh? there are people who are building the lodges just beside the very beautiful and pristine lakes they are destroying the nature 100% i didn't go to places i'm not i'm not going to mention because of course it's my country and uh, i i don't i want to basically preserve it but i'm not mentioning the name but people are not respecting it at all not uh, because of the thing they don't want to respect it's just because of the reason they don't know how to respect the nature how to actually understand the nature because mm -hmm. their primary education and their i mean their higher education even most of the times it's based around the earning money it's not becoming a good person a good human mm -hmm. so we need to shift our education system a little bit right. yeah. and then find out the i mean then we will have that kind of lot that will go along with the con, uh, ecology and the environment and the nature mm -hmm. so right. this thing is this thing is more uh, i mean you can see in the north rather than in south and in the plain areas Excellent. so northern areas of northern areas are far better than this perspective thank you for that kolam excellent emma as a travel journalist what are some of the sustainable development strategies that you have picked up Mm. So coming from a journalism background, you know, travel, you know, it should always be ideally a two way relationship where both sides are benefiting. And what I what I witnessed was when the uh, tourist uh, visa uh, uh, restrictions were eased in 2019, uh, there was a great influx of um, social media influencers, which perhaps presented a slightly skewed version of travel in the country. And so I think it's our responsibility to make sure that that view is balanced because in order for it to be um, as tourism you know, develops and, and, and blossoms, for it to be sustainable and longstanding, there needs to be this the respect in place for, you know, there are conservative elements that can't be denied and not should, shouldn't be swept under the carpet because it's all about, you know, respecting those differences. Um, mm -hmm. And just ensuring that travelers are, as Golem said, going prepared like that they're they're doing their background research so that they can behave um in respectful ways when they're traveling i think that's an important element as well for me great excellent thank you colin would you like to add anything to that i think it's a big challenge um for all countries to try and create true sustainable tourism um i i know we're talking about pakistan but in in scotland you know tourism is a big part of um, our, our um, revenue uh, in, in this country, and um, there's no doubt, certainly for 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 tourism into natural ecosystems such as the Karakoram, um, a huge increase in footfall, in my opinion, is not sustainable there. And there comes a point where, I mean, people fundamentally are generally not good for the environment. They're not good for flora and fauna. And, uh, you know, I've seen evidence of this all, all over my own country. The landscape gets trashed when the public get access to it. And it's very difficult. I mean, people imagine the government will do something about it, but they won't. And the problem is, in general, is that pe people market, they want people in, they want the revenue, but there's no safety valves in the system. Nobody comes along and says, actually, um, this is creating quite a lot of damage or rubbish or, and we need to limit the numbers. That will never happen. So mm. once somewhere opens up, it's never ever likely to go back to where it once was. And um, the important message is get there as soon as possible because mm. It, it, it will evolve into something that it's not right now. And I've seen signs of that happening in Pakistan. 
And I've seen lots of it happening in Scotland in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if there is actually something such as sustainable tourism. I don't think it's an exact, I think it's one of these sort of fashionable words that people like to use. But um, certainly in terms of the natural environment, it's not good news for it. Great. It's great to hear a different perspective and a different side to it. Thank you, Colin. Johnny, what are some of your responsible travel tips as an adventure travel company? I, I, I mean, I have to say, I, I agree with a lot of what Colin's just said there. I, I think it is inevitable that the world changes generally. People become more affluent. They want to travel. I think in Pakistan, the biggest issue that we have is the domestic market, if I can say so. I, I think it's, more, which is more what Gulam was saying, I think it's more the domestic market um, that uh, needs to be educated about how to um, enjoy these places, but do so in a responsible manner. I think generally speaking, and maybe this is arrogant of me, I don't know, but I think certainly from a Wild Frontiers perspective, the kind of people that we bring are interested culturally aware people they don't want to annoy people they want to help they want to be engaged in a responsible way and I think generally they are uh, we of course have a number of uh, literal projects that we do through our Wild Frontiers Foundation which is education uh, which is tree planting which is stuff like this um, but of course it's a tiny tiny amount relative to you know an overall country like Pakistan but I'll give you just one example and of course this could have happened to anybody anywhere but I was walking up to Fairy Meadows which is one of the most beautiful pristine amazing places on earth and these two Pakistani lads were walking up in front of me and they were munching away on a packet of biscuits and when they finished the packet they just threw it and I said whoa 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 hang on a minute guys you don't want to leave that there and they both said, cool, you know, you're absolutely right. I'm really sorry. And they went and picked it up and carried it up. And it was just a, it was a silly moment of kind of, you know, insignificant, but it kind of, it, it, it makes a point. I think there's obviously a huge population in Pakistan and they are starting to find their travel feet much more than they ever were. And I think it just, I mean, the horrible situation we saw in Murray the other day with the, with the terrible uh, disaster that happened with all the snow. I, I think it's that, that, that there is a danger that, that mass movements of people into the mountains where it just can't handle that sort of transition can cause enormous problems. Um, so I, I think that's a challenge that Pakistan has. Right. And, and I think John, I, yep. think, mm -hmm. I think, John, the, the other thing that I, I think some of the, the, the travel agents in Pakistan are very guilty of is not actually briefing the people that they send into the areas that we're talking about in the north about altitude and actually how tough mm -hmm. it is surviving in the glaciers. I mean, yeah. the people that you will take and that, that you know, I meet on, on, on treks, you know, coming from the UK, they usually are fell walkers or the doom and rows, but they're outdoors. They might be camping, um, you know, two or three days a year or longer um, in the landscape. So they're outdoor people. They're used to walking, but there's a lot of indigenous Pakistanis that are, as you say, that are finding um, the opportunity to travel, which obviously they want to do. Um, but these um, trips onto the glaciers. They're not simple camping trips. You know, you've got the altitude. And if you're, if you're not used to walking uphill, it is a hard, hard slog. And a lot of them find it very, very uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So one of my last questions was for someone who's never been to Pakistan before, where do they start? What are some of the places and experiences that should be in a first time as itinerary? Um, can I ask Ghulam you first? <laughs> Yeah, I would I would simply go with the first of all is uh, the personal interest of the person. If he's what is the age group, what is the uh, I mean interest of that person? If he's more into nature and wildlife or just a normal tourist, <clears throat> if he's a normal tourist, keep him on the road. Do not take him on the tracks or on the difficult areas where your jeeps bump a lot and you don't find a resting place properly. But if he's a nature lover, he, he wants to go on the 
I mean, the places where the normal people don't go. Then now we will start our, there are two routes. We uh, start from Islamabad to um, uh, Skardu. From Skardu, take a jeep to Deosai, camp for there. Take, I mean, it depends how many nights you want to spend there. What is your plan? And then cross the Deosai, land, land into Chilam, and from Chilam to go to Hunza and look around Gilgit and other those areas. And then you can come back either by road or take a flight and come back to Islam. But it takes like eight to 10 days. Uh, I mean, if you, I mean, uh, just visiting the areas. But if you are a photographer, multiply it at five. <laughs> I mean, for a photographer, just one picture means maybe two, three days, maybe more, maybe less. But if he likes a moment, if he likes a place, he has to come there again and again. For example, for just one picture of Kurumba, it took me two, I mean, two years. In one year I planned it, I couldn't hike over there because I didn't have the energy. And it was mm -hmm. snowstorm, we have a whole group that had to move back just because of lack of food, we, I mean, on the Wakhan corridor. Uh, and then the next, after two years, when we went there again, we had enough food and then we were able to do some hike and go on the I mean, vantage point and take some pictures of the Kurumba Lake. So uh, I think um, this is from me. Uh, let's see what other says. Great tips, great. Colleen, what was your planned route or itinerary when you did your Karakum expeditions? Well, I think it's really important if you're going um, to do a trekking holiday, you, 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 you know, you call up someone like John at Well Frontiers, you know, the, the, the people like him and there are other specialist travel operators in Pakistan, obviously, that have the knowledge and the contacts. Um, and importantly, they know how to get through the paperwork system with passes and permits and so forth. And, and if, if you don't have that expertise in place, then it, you can waste so much of your time in Pakistan doing nothing really, just trying to get you know, over some of the, the, the bureaucracy and, and you might have some travel problems as well. So you know, go to a specialist operator, discuss with them what you, your aspirations are, what you would like to do, and they'll come up with an itinerary and, uh, and a cost for you. Um, and I mean, it might be part of a group. There, there's obviously group itineraries that you can join um, for, for small groups. But if you've got the budget, you can go in and, and organise a personal itinerary. And it means that you know, the group can go at the pace you dictate rather than at the group pace. Um, mm -hmm. So it just helps you meet your objectives. If, you know, like me, you're, you're trying to, um, you know, do something specific rather than just be on, on a vacation, essentially. So mm -hmm. use local knowledge and people that have got good reputations. And I've been in the business for a long time. Good, good. Great tips. Thank you. Johnny, if you can share your favorite parts in your signature itinerary of Pakistan, and um, Emma, since you traveled with um, Wild Frontiers to Pakistan, if you can just add along as well while Johnny goes through his slides. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen now. Oops, there we are. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Sorry, didn't mean to share that one. Wait a minute. Uh, I'll better save it, haven't I? Uh, hang on. Sorry, wrong one. Oh, bloody hell, now I've closed it. Hang on a second, sorry. No <laughs> sorry, best laid plans, I had it there. Hang on a minute, I'll open it up again. Wait a minute, here we go. Now then, I've just got to move that over to that. Do, 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 do. Shall I jump in while you're doing the tech? I was yeah, just saying, come on, so sorry. I, um, Go for it, After um, I went to visit my grandfather's school um, in near Gauragali, but afterwards, you're right, I joined uh, Johnny's uh, classic uh, Hindu Kush adventure, which is 15 days. And it's such a good introduction to Pakistan for first time travelers. I mean, it was voted one of the top 50 trips of a lifetime by National Geographic and uh, a well-deserved place. Um, and I'll let him tell you the rest. <laughs> Sorry, so uh, after that little blip, uh, here we go. So the, the first trip I ever put together for Wild Frontiers was called the Hindu Kush Adventure. And uh, uh, sorry, um, you were just saying that is the one you went on, wasn't it? 
Yeah. So what I've what I've put up here is, is a slightly elongated version of that because um, the 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 Hindu Kush adventure kind of is a typical fourteen day trip. It finishes. It starts in Islamabad, does this loop, but finishes in Hunza and comes back down the Karakoram Highway. Whereas our summer mountain festival explorer, bit of a mouthful, uh, goes all the way out to Skardu as well, which which really kind of from from a, from a cultural touring mountain landscape point of view kind of covers pretty much the whole of the north. Um, of course, it doesn't include a trek up to K2 or the Snow Lake trek or whatever, but those are all kind of available as you get up towards Skardu. So, so this is one of our most popular trips. It runs during the summer months because um, the Babusa Pass, which you can see pretty much in the middle of the screen there, 4,173 meters, is only open for about three months of the year. So this is a, a typical trip, um, and it really shows you the best of, 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 of this part of, of Pakistan. Um, it starts in Islamabad. Uh, a lot of our clients will uh, either pre-trip or post-trip extend to Lahore. I know we've got a, a few Lahoreites on tonight. A magical city. I love it. It was my first taste of Pakistan as I came from India across the border. Um, you know, we were talking about food earlier, Food Street, Cuckoo's Den, sitting up there on the rooftops, looking down at the Bachai Mosque eating, uh, you know, gorgeous food, fabulous. L love Lahore, great historic city. Um, but from, a, from a, an access point to the north, Islamabad is just that much closer. Good contacts with British Airways, etc., which is great that they're flying again into, into uh, Pakistan. So you start in Islamabad, uh, a new city, of course, that everyone knows. Um, not culturally massively important, but, but some really nice things to do. And of course, you've been on a long flight, so chill out, relax before you head on up into the mountains. And the first place you're going to kind of pass is the Swat Valley. Um, this was um, probably the main tourist area of Pakistan back in the kind of 80s and 90s, went um, off, off grid in the kind of 2000s and has now come back again. And of course, it's one of the most beautiful parts of Pakistan, the foothills of the Hindu Kush, really, um, with its very interesting Gandharan um, period uh, history. So that dates back to kind of 800 BC to roughly 500 AD. Uh, mm -hmm. Many stupas, many uh, artifacts of that Buddhist era, which you can see in some of the museums. We generally stay at the Serena Hotel, which is the old Wally of Swats Palace. So that's a nice place to stay on your road trip as you head north up over the Luari Pass, which is 3000 meters high. Um, you, I was talking earlier about the Willis Jeeps. This is what they look like. And you can see there that chap, the roof's off. He can stand up and take photos. Um, you do want to be slightly more cautious as you come down the other side. I've always tried to count how many bends there are, never really got there, but certainly over, over 40, I think. Um, there is a tunnel that goes through the Luari, uh, the, 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 the Luari Pass now, uh, which of course has opened up Chitral, um, but we tend to go over the top as we're traveling generally in the summer months. And then you get to Chitral. Chitral was a kingdom in its own right, completely cut off from the rest of uh, Pakistan or indeed the greater Indian continent as it was pre-1947. Uh, it's backdropped by the beautiful Mount Tirich Mir, which is about 7,500 meters. Um, and it's a historic uh, little town. It's very sleepy, very fun, very uh, laid back. Um, the important kind of things to see there are the fort, which was the scene of uh, a, a, a famous siege that took place in 1895, um, where a, a group of British soldiers were, were marooned, uh, surrounded by um, angry uh, locals. They managed to, uh, to fend themselves off, but it was a, a, a hold your breath moment for empire back then. Um, the Markor up in Chitralgul, and as we were discussing earlier, um, the snow leopards that uh, hang out there in the winter months. Um, and of course, you're almost bound to see a game of frontier polo. The, the, the Chitralis, like the Gilgitis, absolutely love their polo. And for the summer months, they're playing every other day, and you'll see that. Again, some fabulous accommodation. The Hindu Kush Heights is where our group stay. Um, which is a, a fabulous hotel owned and run by one of the former princes of Chitral, uh, Prince Sirajul Mulk, an old friend of mine, and a uh, fabulous hotel there, 
we've been staying there for, for years. So just a little bit out of town, but a nice little bit of luxury. From there, we head into the Kalash Valleys. And um, this is where, as Anam was explaining, my kind of history with the Kalash uh, goes back a long way. I lived with them for three months in 1996, wrote a book partially about the Kalash. Um, and uh, this is where my kind of heart lies, if you like. They're a fascinating group of people. Um, they are a pagan people. They worship animistic gods. Um, they uh, live in three narrow valleys that buttress up against Afghanistan. Um, and they worship uh, at, at festivals. They have pagan festivals. They live in a pure and impure lands. Um, and the festivals take place three or four times a year, depending on which valley you're in. Um, and we always try to take uh, our groups to go and see them. We get invited by the Kalash to come there and, and take part in these very colorful celebrations. Um, from here, we head northwest, uh, sorry, northeast, I should say, around uh, the side of Tirichmir up towards the Shandor Pass. Um, this is a beautiful spot, uh, 3,800 meters. For me, this is where the Indian subcontinent transforms into a kind of Central Asia. You start getting the big steppe lands as you go up here. Um, it's also the scene of the annual Shandor Polo Festival, which takes place in July every year, um, where teams from Gilgit come and play teams from Chitral. It's, 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 it's very highly fought. It's a bit like um, from a UK, so from an English perspective, Liverpool Man U um, clashing at 3,800 meters. Um, and then we come down to Gilgit, which the, the valley as you drive down over the Shandor Pass is absolutely beautiful. You come down this gorgeous valley uh, and you come to Gilgit. Two things of, import, of, of interest in Gilgit. One is the, uh, there's a Christian cemetery there. <clears throat> the most famous um, uh, person laid to rest there is a chap called George Hayward, who was a player of the great game, that, um, that uh, war of attrition between the Tsarist Russia and Imperial Britain back in the 19th century, when he was, went up into the higher parts of Kashmir, the Darkot Pass, to map the passes uh, for the British government. Um, and was murdered for his, uh, for, 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 for his trials. Um, he lies there along with a, a, a other luckless uh, Christians, Westerners that were sent out to this far post of empire. Um, so that's one interesting thing. And the other thing is, is an amazing uh, Buddha carved onto the rock face um, just outside of town. Again, uh, example of the Gandaharan influence. Um, you get a great hotel there, the Serena. Um, you, again, you can see a watch a game of Frontier Polo, there's an interesting bazaar to walk around before you head up the Karakoram Highway uh, and into the Hunza Valley. And this is one moment I love um, when you come round the corner uh, on the Karakoram Highway and your group sees Mount Rakaposhi for the first time. It's usually the first time any of them will have seen a 7,000 meter peak, um, 7,788 7, meters. Um, and it simply takes your breath away. It, you, you can't imagine what it looks like if you've never seen that sort of mountain before. I mean, bearing in mind it's a third higher than the highest mountain in Europe. Um, from here, we head on to, oops, sorry, to Hunza. Um, and that is fabled as being, if not the most beautiful place on earth, certainly one of them, um, a place where, where James um, uh, Hilton set Shangri-La with the famous Baltic Fort sitting sentinel. Um, we generally stay at a hotel called Eagle's Nest. Um, this is at Doika, uh, just above Karimabad, the little village in Hunza. Um, and these people there, group of ours, are sitting looking at the mountains. There are seven 7,000 meter peaks to be seen all around you. Uh, this is the, my computer is not picking up the pictures quite as quickly as it should. There we go. Um, this is the Eagle's Nest. It's a simple hotel, but my goodness, there's nothing simple about the view. You can see it from your bedroom window there and where you have your breakfast. Great walks. You need a head for heights. You don't always have to walk this kind of way, but there's some lovely walks down into town. Um, and, uh, sorry, from here, from Hunza, we can then head down towards Fairy Meadows, which is the uh, 
westernmost part of the Himalayas. So this is Nanga Parva, which represents the very end of the Himalayas and the start of the Hindu Kush and the Karakoram. There are some very good little huts there to stay at. I mean, we're not talking luxury, but it's very comfortable. Um, before we head on to the Skardu region. And it's from here that the big trekking uh, parties uh, start. This is where you're gonna access K2 from. Again, it's really interesting, this is the Indus River. Um, there's more examples of the Gandhar and Buddhist um, uh, era on, carved onto the rocks. Um, there's a very interesting old bazaar. Again, there's Frontier Polo being played. And this is one of my favorite hotels in the world. It, it, it's Kaplu Palace. It's run by the uh, Serena Group. It was opened six, seven years ago now. Uh, and it's a stunning place um, with great rooms and, you know, real, real bit of luxury. Um, from here, you can head up the Hershey Valley, um, where you, you, if you carry it on, you'll go right over what's called the Gondagora La onto the Boltora Glacier and, and uh, onto K2. Um, this is where Wild Frontiers Foundation was founded when we were asked to build a school in a very small village called Balagon, which we did, and we still run the school there now. Um, so that's kind of doing a, a full circuit. As you come round, you can either fly back from Skardu or come round going clockwise through the Dosai National Park and the Dosai Plateau, and then down back onto the Karakoram Highway, or indeed the Babusa Pass route, through the Kagan Valley and back to Islamabad. So we run that trip both clockwise and anti-clockwise through the summer months. Um, of course, there are shorter trips. And also, you know, we shouldn't forget that there are some incredible routes to do in the South through the Indus civilizations and um, yeah, other parts of Pakistan. So that's my kind of uh, go-to Northern trip. Um, yeah, I will stop sharing my screen. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Johnny. That was incredible. And I should be sharing links to Wild Frontiers. You can learn more about Johnny's tours from there. Um, just before we move on to the Q&A, uh, we are slightly running late. I just want you to, guys to look out for a survey, uh, which our editorial director Aisha is going to post in the chat box. And if you complete that survey, it will really help us learn how many of you will be interested to attend an in-person Pakistan travel show or conference in the UK later on in the year, which we're currently planning. That would be great for us. Um, so just moving on to the Q&A. Some of the uh, questions have been already answered by the panelists, but there's one here. What's the weather like in the Karakaram in summer? Would I need winter gear to visit places like Gilgit? This is from Ian. Any of you can answer that one. Colin, maybe you want to take that on? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you'll need winter gear, but I mean, there's always the, the danger that um, it, it can turn cold or it depends um, where you're going to camp and how high you're going to camp. Um, so I think um, you'd really need to get more uh, information um, about where you plan to go and and, um, and just make sure you've got enough clothing, to enough layers to, to make sure that you're, you're not cold. Um, but I, I, I don't think you're going to need down jackets unless you're at, at, at some sort of altitude. Yeah, Gilgit's, Gilgit's fairly low, isn't it? So if it was only Gilgit, I mean, our summer trips, yeah, you don't need much for there. In fact, it can be 40 degrees in the middle of summer. Um, <laughs> but but, but as, as you say, Colin, if you're planning a trip, uh, a trek up the, up the Boltora Glacier, then you'd need the right equipment. Great. Um, just another question. I know we've already answered uh, whether it's possible to travel independently, Glam answered that, but someone's asking in the group, um, if it's just a trip, um, to Lahore or Islamabad, um, is it okay to travel independently? And I just want to add, what are the uh, your top five places to see or experience in Islamabad or Lahore? Anybody can take that. It's an open question. Uh, yes, it, 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 it's it's perfectly easy to travel between Islamabad and Lahore. There's no 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 trouble there at all. Um, you can either hire a car. You can go on one of the Dayu buses, which are which are very efficient. Um, and there's the train service that goes from Pindi to Lahore. So, so you can do any of those things. Um, I think my favorite mosque in the world is the Mohammed, uh, not the Mohammed Khan, sorry, the, um, 
the Wazir Khan Mosque Wazir in Lahore. Lahore. That is Lahore. absolutely yeah. stunning. And if anybody goes, and you know, I'd been to Lahore five or six times before I actually went there and I couldn't believe I'd missed it all those other times. So uh, yeah, that would be my standout um, site in Lahore. Brilliant. I'm sorry yeah. to say we'll have to wrap up now. We're revealing slightly late. I just want to say a huge thank you, first of all, to all our partners and sponsors, Pakistan High Commission London, and Wild Frontiers, to our wonderful panelists. Um, I feel like I can sit here all day and continue listening to your fascinating stories. And also thank you to everyone who tuned in from home. Please do keep an eye out on our website, um, Cat Profiles of Nary Traveller, which I will drop the links in. Uh, we will be posting more information about Pakistan. And if you haven't already, do grab a copy of our magazine. Um, we will now end this on a very short video by Wild Frontiers, Pakistan in 60 seconds. And I just want to end on a note to say that the real Pakistan is certainly not defined by the actions of a few. And the stereotypical image that we see in the media, it's not the country as a whole. So let Pakistan embrace you with open arms. Thank you for tuning in, everyone. And take care and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was a